to Mesa Sanitary District Board of Directors to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Director Arthur Perry. Here. Assistant Secretary Robert Lee. Here. Secretary Arlen Schaefer. Present. Vice President James Fairman. Present. And President Michael Schaefer. Here. Thank you. Uh, public comments. This is the uh, time and place for persons in the audience to make comments on items within our subject matter that are not listed on the agenda. Anyone wishing to speak under public comments? Seeing none, I have a question. Are we to do the closed session after the study session? It's up to you. If you want to do it before or after, it's, it's, that's why we put it at 9.30, so it's really up to you. Let's, let's do it after, give, you know, give everybody a chance. Yeah, I, I, that's what I, I, I agree. Our, okay, we do this closed session after the... Okay, then we'll, we'll do the closed session immediately following the study session. Okay, great. Uh, let's go to our items of study then, Scott. Item number one. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Nabila Guzman will be giving this report as well as uh, introducing our guest speaker. Great. Good morning, Nabila. Good morning, President Schieffer, members of the board. Uh, the sewer system management plan must be updated every two years. Uh, the last audit was in November 2015, and in November 2017, staff solicited proposals for, conducti for conducting an internal audit. We received five proposals, but we decided to award it to EEC Environmental because they provided the quickest timeline to conduct it. But I'd like to present Joe Jenkins uh, from EEC, who will provide a presentation of the audit and his findings. Thank you. Morning, Joe. Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. We, it flies, doesn't it? We, we took a year off. <laughs> it's okay if I control it, right? I don't know if it can. Oh. Oh. Okay. Sure. Well, I, uh, yeah, so um, this is a very good introduction, so we can just get right into it. So. Um, you can go back one slide so I can brag about EEC Environmental a little bit. Um, so again, my name is Joseph Jenkins. I was the lead auditor on this project. And then we had uh, Jim Kolk, who provided some te additional technical support. And Keith Silva was our regulatory advisor. He spent previously 30 years with the EPA. So he's, he's good to bounce questions off of. And then, um, as we mentioned, uh, EEC has conducted previous odds for the district in 2011 and 2013, and then other cities in Orange County. So just a, a little bit of background of our audit history. <clears throat> so as Nabila mentioned, the SSMP audit has to be conducted at least once every two years with the previous audit for the district conducted in 2015. It includes a comprehensive review of the SSMP document, comparing the document to the requirements of the waste discharge requirements, but also to the, the general actual district practices and how they're being implemented. The SSMP should reflect what the day-to-day -day operations of the district actually are. But it's, oh, please go back, yeah, sorry. Um, there should be more than just a yes or no checklist. Are you doing it, aren't you doing it? Should be a, con a comprehensive a review of the district practices and really it's an opportunity to Im improve uh, programs and enhance programs. Uh, so we can go to the next one. So before we get into this year's audit, we just review uh, the findings from the 2015 audit. Uh, there was a single uh, non nonconformance here. Uh, the district uh, had not implemented, um, did not have CIP improvement project passed the, the 2015 year until um, that was addressed, and the, the CAPs have been implemented since then. So we can go to the next one. So this was the general uh, audit process. We conducted an initial kickoff meeting with staff. We re did a review of the SSMP document, reviewed documentation and available data. We conducted staff interviews, and then prepared the report. And within the much longer, bigger report, uh, it identifies both major and, mi and minor nonconformances, uh, provides some corrective actions to those nonconformances, and then provides additional recommended program enhancements. And on a positive note, there was no major nonconformances identified. We identified two minor nonconformances, 
and then 11 recommended program enhancements. And so the, the difference between major and minor, major nonconformance can, could result in, in a fine or additional enforcement actions by the state, and minor would just be them recommending corrective actions. Some of the documents and data we reviewed, the historic SSO data, sewer cleaning history, the, the current capital improvement plan, rehabilitation replacement projects, the current CCTV project that's being conducted with ProPipe, the fog control program, pump station management, and the training history, uh, amongst other document, available documents. Here's the staff that were interviewed. We did s single interviews with the general manager and district engineer, and then kind of a group interview session with the wastewater management staff and SCADA technician, um, each one lasting between an hour and a half to two hours or so. So we can get into the findings. And so the, you know, the, the best metric to determine whether or not a SSMP is effective or, or a sewer system management program is, is doing what it's supposed to do is based on public SSOs. And so you can see by the graph and the, the downward trend and then having zero public SSOs in 2017, the district is very effective at implementing the SSMP in the, the program. And so this graph here represents the, the recovery rate for SSOs that do occur. Um, since 2015, the district has not had an SSO where they did not recover 100% of the spill. And actually, the, the one spill that happened in 2015 just happened in an un unfortunate location where volume was lost to the waters of the state. So I'll do a very good, good job at recovering SSO volume. And so the reasons behind the low SSO rate is, is certainly through a proactive preventative maintenance program. The district currently cleans the entire sewer system once every 18 months, and they're, they're meeting that cleaning frequency. And they're doing this um, a lot through the established programs and established resources that were there, but also through recently added additional resources that has allowed them to keep a lot of the, the work that's being conducted in-house uh, to apply for you know, faster response times and more effective work being completed. And one of the most recent additions was the, was the CCTV trailer, so when, when crews are out there, they encounter a problem, they can identify the cause of the problem and, and remediate it quickly. So the district is also ha has a, a proactive manhole rehabilitation program and doing planning more manhole rehabilitation this year including the installation of composite manhole covers that prevent uh, inflow and infiltration of rainwater into the sewer system, helping with capacity issues. Provide a lot of education and training, including the operators uh, getting their CWEA certifications. Uh, the wastewater superintendent actually has his grade four certification, which is the highest level of certification you can have with CWEA. They attend regular conferences and, and attend the Orange County WDR general group that the district engineer actually helps run. And most importantly, the education that they're doing is well documented, which is uh, something we generally find that agencies don't do such a good job of. And having the, the available resources and, and replacement parts inventory is also key. For SSO response in, in terms of recovering the high percentage rate, the district has an emergency response plan in place. The staff is adequately trained in SSO response, and the necessary uh, resources are available for that response, including backup pumps, generators, and, and sandbags to block storm drain systems. Also, to help with SSO response, the, the district has purchased uh, the adjacent property to the yard and are expanding uh, the yard in that location to better centrally locate resources and also you know, better organize the yard to stay on top of inventory. <clears throat> the sewer master plan is, is nearly complete, should be completed uh, by the end of 2018, but the district has already started addressing some of the structural grade five defects that have been identified that um, would be in the master plan that's typically a focus of a master plan and, and is using the GIS 
to conduct hydraulic modeling to identify any, any capacity issues within the sewer system. The district does have a, a CIP in, in, the, in the meantime uh, until the master plan is complete uh, to address you know, ongoing sewer system management uh, issues and needs. And uh, according to district staff during interviews, the available funding for planned project, uh, projects is available. As I mentioned, ProPipe has been conducting CCTV of the entire sewer system. This started back in 2016. And as the, the most severe structural defects, the grade five structural defects are identified, they're being prioritized for repair. And so since 2016, 290 segments have been repaired and 72 uh, laterals have been trimmed that are protruding into the sewer system. The district is also very proactive at reducing the hot spots or enhanced maintenance locations. These are the areas of the sewer system that are required to be cleaned more frequently than annually. And so there's a, a hot spot sewer subcommittee that meets quarterly to go over the hot spots and work towards mitigating those locations. And so in 2010, there were 95, and in, in two, by 2017, there's now only 21. So being very proactive with that. Okay, next slide. Here's a, a snapshot of the, the plan, 2017-2018 capital improvement plan. So the, um, from the, the graph here, you see a, a lot of the, the budget is, is towards pump station rehabilitations and force main rehabilitation. And a, a lot of this is because there were uh, pump stations and force mains that were previously scheduled for abandonment that the district has decided not to abandon, and so now they need to be rehabilitated and, and brought up to speed. So fog control program. Again, a good metric to determine the effectiveness of a fog control program is the number of, of fog-related public SSOs you're having. You know, being the district's fog program consultant, I would like to say you're welcome for this graph, but you know, really this graph is an indication of all of the programs, um, you know, the, the proactive sewer system cleaning, the rehabilitation and replacement program that's happening along with the fog program that, you know, you haven't had a, a fog related public SSO since 2013, you know, which is it's good to see. And so on the next slide, More details of what the program includes. Uh, it's, it's mainly about identifying and inspecting food service establishments. Uh, what the district does is concentrates resources on more of the high risk facilities that could discharge a high quantity of fog to the sewer system by inspecting them more frequently, so quarterly, semi-annual. And then the lower risk ones are, are inspected biannually. And then identifying new facilities as they as they open for business or change ownership. Requiring grease removal devices for those higher risk facilities or facilities that could discharge fog. Identifying any new potential fog related hotspots. And the district also has a good fog disposal for the uh, residential program. Uh, there's a, a recycling center at Orange Coast College where residences can take their fire grease and whatnot and dispose of it there, which is, is probably helping and very beneficial. So we can get into the, the two minor nonconformances that I mentioned at the beginning. So the first one is the, the current organizational chart does not accurately reflect district staffing. This is a very common nonconformance when you do an SSMP audit. There's typically a lot of change order or changeover and changing of positions and staffing within an organization. So just updating the org chart would, would easily take care of this one. And then the second one is that the district has not created overflow emergency response plans for four of the pump stations. And the reason for this, according to district staff, is these were the pump stations that were previously designated for abandonment, so emergency response plans weren't originally developed. Since now they've decided to keep them active, the, the plans will need to now be developed for them. So you'd wanna have specific plans for each pump station that deals with the nuances of each station and, and how to respond if there's a spill there. So there's 11 recommended program enhancements that we identified. 
Um, these aren't required to be implemented, but we recommend should be considered by the district. Um, the first one is adding more measurable goals to quantify the effectiveness of the SSMP. Uh, an attachment to the SSMP, there are performance metrics in there, and so we, we recommended choosing some of those performance metrics and, and listing those up front in the goals section of the SSMP just to determine the effectiveness of the program. So typically agencies use obviously SSOs that occur and then SSO response. But, but something that you can periodically review to see how effective the program is. Uh, on the, the next page, uh, identify additional training opportunities for district staff, create and implement key standard operating procedures, and, and we in the, in the report list out some examples of operate, standard operating procedures that could be implemented. Update sewer standards to include new technologies, and conduct emergency bypass training for high-risk pump stations. And, and, and that's, that recommendation there is what a lot of agencies with pump stations are starting to do, practicing going out to ones that they, you know, you could potentially have a really high, uh, high volume spill at and having the staff practice taking it offline, bypassing it if that's the procedure to bypass it. Um, so that if something does happen there, they're familiar with what needs to be done. Conduct periodic SSO simulation training. Staff do attend simulation training. There's a, a good simulation training at OCSD. This recommendation is more on a smaller scale, possibly at the district yard, where they can practice filling out forms and, and blocking off storm drains and, and that sort of thing. Standardize the term for hotspots throughout the SSMP. Through, in the SSMP, you see it referred to as both enhanced maintenance location and hotspot. I assume enhanced maintenance location is the preferred term for it, so just using that standard term throughout. Develop written enforcement response plans for FOG noncompliances. Develop a standing operating procedure for interactions with the City of Costa Mesa, and this is more particular to uh, plan review and identif identification of new restaurants. And then just continue re uh, residential education, especially at fog-related hotspots, so either handouts or, or flyers or door hangers uh, in, in using that approach. I know I went through things very quickly, but if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to field them at this time. First of all, on the procedure here that you're recommending, mm -hmm. do you have a timeline on this? Yes. Um, so. Uh, within the report, we, we provided an Excel spreadsheet that has the timelines, um, but th for the two minor nonconformances, we, we list in there July 2018. Okay. So I by I missed that. <coughs> and I just wanted to comment that I thought that the report was outstanding. Great. I, I feel like I graduated. <laughs> I really learned a lot from it. It was very good. Oh, very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations. <laughs> I have a question for Steve. How many bypass pumps do we have? I think that, is that adequate for what we need? Or yes. do, okay. Rob, please. Thank you. A couple things. The interval with, with, within which we clean once every 18 months, that stacks up very well in the industry, meaning most, for most agencies take much longer than that. And I'm not sure of any that actually beat that and do their whole system once a year. So 18 months is really excellent for that interval. Uh, getting in on the interactions with the city, we have myself and Bao or Steve attend development review committee meetings at the city. Or even if we don't attend a meeting, they send us a list of upcoming projects that includes all the restaurants. So when I see it in advance, I do send it to Joe. So they're still in developing plan stage by the time Joe gets it. And lastly, trying to update sewer standards to today's standards, horizontal directional drilling, <coughs> no dig this, that kind of stuff. I tried that once already, and nobody has developed any standards because there's so many different ones of types of drilling, types of short liners, small sections of 
CIPP. There's other things. So uh, we can look at it again and update something, but it, it, it's, it's not so easy. It's not like everybody has them except for us. Nobody has them. So, so that's where we stand on those items. Um, Joe, being a special district that handles just sewer, mm -hmm. and obviously trash, but I mean, we're dedicated to sewer. Have you done these audits for other organizations, for example, water districts that might have a sewer operate, a wastewater operation, or cities that have a wastewater operation? Yes. How do we compare with those people, or those entities, excuse me? Right. And, and so, so very well, um, is in short, you know, uh, the best city I can compare the district to in that sense is the city of Santa Ana. Uh, they're slightly larger as far as their system wise, but they do both water and sewer. And so the key there is just um, keeping, a, a, they try to keep a very distinct uh, separation between the water people and the, the sewer people. There's some cross training in there. Um, I think the only only thing with that is they may have additional available resources to them, so additional trucks, uh, additional staff if needed, um, and, and then they also different funding opportunities where they can use you know water rates to help out with sewer projects and that sort of thing. Um, compare us then. There was one chart that showed the the SSOs, and the, it was a dramatic drop. Right. I, I think our staff has done an outstanding job of. Getting that almost to zero and yeah. pretty close to zero. Right. How does that compare with Santa Ana? Okay. Walton the Gale Water District, which right. is both. So, yeah, in that table, you saw the little star that said um, the state average was 3.8 SSOs per 100 miles. And actually, that 3.8 is of similar size sewer systems. So, it's sewer systems between 100 and 300 miles. And so these, you see that state average of, of 3.8 the district has always been usually below two SSOs per 100 miles, which is very good. Um, the, the city of Santa Ana and other Orange County cities are, are very proactive in their, in their SSO prevention and their SSMP program. So they also stay around that you know, one or zero spills per year kind of range. But you know, typically when you get much larger systems, say like Irvine Ranch Water District or someone like that, they, they usually will be in that 3.8 to 4 range. You know, you're going to have sewer spills in large systems. It's going to happen. Um, the main goal should be preventing the Category 1 spills, which is the spills that reach surface waters, and then also having a high volume recovery rate. And also not having repeat SSOs at the same location you know, over and over and over again. Um, a minor change you might want to make on your slide. CDBA operator grade four, the operator grades actually go to five. Steve, you probably have a collections, and that is, is that limited to four? Okay. So collect, okay, I understand, yeah. Um, and in the agencies that you've reviewed that have both water and wastewater, mm -hmm. do they mix the equipment? Uh, do they use the, vector, the sewer vector trucks for water emergency? Not, not typically. They, don't, they won't typically use a lot of the sewer equipment for water work. Um, but I, what I've seen them do, though, is use, the, like, say they'll use, like, a bobtail um, dump truck for that they would typically use for water construction and water projects. And then at the end of the day, they'll take it back to their yard and fill it up with sand in case they have an SSO for SSO response, you know, something like that. They, they typically don't like to use vac trucks and stuff for water. <laughs> for sure, yeah. yeah. I've seen cities that do that mm -hmm. in the Midwest, but okay. The VAC guys are also very protective of their trucks. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have a request for a public comment. Anything else for us, Joe? Before I, I do not. No. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to conduct the SSMP audit for the district. I appreciate the thoroughness and the, I, I like I like the fact that you kept using the word, the term that our district is proactive. Oh, yes. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank Thanks you. Again, All right. Uh, Mr. Mosher, you wish to make a comment? Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, President Schaefer, members of the board. My name is Jim Mosher. Although the district has had a, a very good record 
recently there, there was, of course, a large spill a few years ago on Anniversary Lane in the city of Newport Beach. And uh, I understand and appreciate that a number of technical improvements have been made to the pump station there to improve the reliability of that area. However, my understanding is a, a major contributor to the size of that spill was a lack of coordination between this district and the city of Newport Beach in the sense of people knowing who to report spills to and getting them handled by the proper agency. And speaking of proactive, I have very little sense that the city of Newport Beach would be proactive about correcting that situation. So I am hoping we might hear what steps have been taken by this district to improve the communication between Costa Mesa Sanitary District and city of Newport Beach so that when citizens report spills in those border areas, which are considerable, not just anniversary lane, there's a large border area, uh, that they're promptly handled by the correct, that the calls are promptly routed to the correct jurisdiction and how those improvements have been working since, since then. Thank you. Bob? Uh, yes, thank you. We do have a very good relationship with the city of Newport Beach wastewater folks, their vectors and all. We had a spill, after the big spill, we had a spill on Indus that was smaller, happened on New Year's Day, but Newport Beach actually beat us out there and then they stayed with us until everything was taken care of. So we have that set up, meaning one call does it all. We know who to call down there, they know who to call for us. But it obviously would always be a good idea to uh, remind everybody and start mm -hmm. passing out names and phone numbers. Yeah. But we, we do provide mutual aid to them and vice versa. Yeah, I, I think what I got out of Mr. Mosher's comments, and correct me if I'm wrong, is we need to make sure that the citizens in those areas know who, who, who to call. I assume they're going to call Newport Beach first. Obviously, they live there. And I, and I think you answered it for me, Rob. As soon as Newport Beach gets the call, they realize that it's us and they're right to us. That's so correct. Okay, Jim. You know, along the same lines, <clears throat> we, had a, we had a problem with the county of Orange in, a, in that spill, as I recall. And, uh, you know, they had, they had locks on the, right. on the gates and we couldn't get in, you know, where we needed to be. Did we get that handled or corrected or, Rob? Well, it came down to, to be able to grade or create an access road or something in the back bay is, that's a very hard thing to do because it's under all the jurisdictions of like Corps of Engineers and everybody. So, <clears throat> We don't really have the ability to do anything other than unlock a gate and drive over what's already there. So but we have implemented changes at the pump station and we've had staff training on what to do if, we, if the, a likely scenario occurs again. We have the keys to that lock? No, we don't. I believe that uh, we can get the count, county inspectors are live meaning they're driving around Southern California at all times. And they'll respond very quickly to us, but we do not have keys. We'll just cut the locks if we need to. That's a good answer. Yeah. I was going to ask the same question. That's, that's a very proactive <laughs> approach, General Manager. Thank you. So, all right. Any questions? Nabila, anything else to add to the report? No, uh, that was it. Great. Thank, thank you all. Okay, we'll move then to item two, the code enforcement <coughs> officer's report. Are you still awake? Awake, sir. All right. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Ed Roberts will be giving this report. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good morning, President Schaefer, members of the board. Uh, Ed Roberts, I'll be doing the February 2018 code enforcement officer report. Uh, for the month, uh, <clears throat> correction, for the month of February 2018, I had a series of nine scavenging investigations throughout the uh, community. 
Uh, for the benefit of the board, there are maps and a brief narrative attached to the report uh, detailing the circumstances of each of those nine investigations. If uh, any of the members of the board have a question regarding a specific one. Okay. Um, also, for the benefit of the board, uh, to the rear of the report, you'll see uh, an at a glance uh, map of the community. <clears throat> you'll see that this month there was a significant uptick. Uh, we've been averaging five, six, perhaps seven over the course of the year. Uh, this month we had nine. Um, three of them were uh, concentrated in the northwest portion of the community, and uh, with the bulk uh, being in the west side, and none on the east side uh, this month. Um, if you look at them, they're, they're spread out pretty evenly throughout the area. Um, there were no incidents of note whatsoever beyond just nine, which is a pretty heavy number uh, for the community. <clears throat> On the direction of a uh, couple of the members of the board for separate areas, I've been looking. Um, they, they've made me aware of some concerns that have been brought to them by members of the community. Uh, so I've been concentrating patrol efforts uh, in the College Park area and on the uh, northwest portion of our community, um, above and beyond what I do in my typical patrol pattern. Um, n like I said, nothing of note. Um, bear with me for a moment, please. And uh, for February 2018, uh, regarding trash container enforcement, we had uh, 95 uh, notices issued uh, throughout the community. Uh, again, nothing of any concern. Uh, do I have any questions from any board members? Most are our guy on the alley on top, behind temperature was active yesterday. He actually opens the gates, you know, the multifamily have enclosures. Yeah, that's city code now, they have them closed. But he's now opening gates and looking in there. And uh, I hadn't noticed him for a couple of weeks. I think I'd mentioned to you last month. And I saw him, just ironically saw him in there yesterday. Uh, the person, the individual I think you're speaking about, uh, President Schaefer, I believe resides to the rear of the Dodge dealership. I think he does. And uh, I, I've, I've had numerous contacts with the uh, individual over the years now. Uh, it's just a matter of staying on top of the individual and uh, catching him as he's doing it. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yes, I have a question regarding the alleys. Yes, sir. Remember a couple of months ago I told you that the city is going to be reconstructing the alleys. Mm -hmm. Did you get a chance to check on that? The, uh, the alleys are probably for me, as far as code enforcement goes, the hot spot uh, for me. That's where I spend the bulk of my time because the high number of high density residential developments are out there. You can have a lot of cans out there. I've been in the Pepper Tree Alley, Royal Palm, uh, East Side, West Side. I, I, I spend, I'd say, a good 50, 60 percent of my time in the actual alleyways of the community. And uh, I, I, I'm seeing what you reported. Um, there's quite a few, go ahead, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had a follow-up question. Oh, no, no, I do, but um, remember the city told us they're gonna start re working in the alleys. Mm -hmm. Did we get a chance to find out when they're gonna start that? I, I have no idea when the, uh, I, I spoke to Larry Dryman uh, from fourth floor. Uh, he's one of the uh, city engineers. Um, apparently, the way I was led to understand, um, the city has a master plan of alley improvements, and uh, they, they're all scheduled based off of the condition of the alleyways and the way they appear. Um, just like we do, they categorize each of their alleys um, in the condition they find it, and they affix uh, a designation as to where it is on their list of alley improvements. Because yeah, I'm just thinking it could affect CRNR if they're going to be closing down the alleys and picking up the trash. I was. Um, well, sir, uh, if if that's an option for you, um, we can certainly work ahead of them. You know, I, I would consider maybe doing a notification to the impacted residents in anticipation of. But uh, I know Larry told me that the uh, the city does go through a notification process uh, for the residents who are going to be impacted by these alley improvements. Uh, this was a while ago when we spoke. I don't know if anything's changed. I just want to find out when we know. So we can let CNR yeah. know. Yeah, well, they, yeah. I think I think even when they do the reconstruction, the alleys are navigable. You know, they they allow access. I I believe. I, that's what I'm just yeah. curious about. Yeah. Are they I, pulling the out? I mean, do they well, demolishing we have, and putting new concrete? Well, I'm not sure because at the liaison meeting they said they're going to be reconstructing yeah. some of the alleys, and so I don't. That's as yeah, much as I know. 
number of monitors. <coughs> sir, sir most, um, what I've observed is that they've gotten rid of the AC, the, the asphalt alley is in favor of, re, you know, they'll put a swale and an actual concrete roadway in on most of these alleys for permanence. So. On your car, you have mm -hmm. this insignia of Costa Mesa Sanitary District. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I want to tell you, people are starting to notice it. I've had calls on it saying, you know, the city has this enforcement. No, 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 no. And I was curious, Gina, on the newsletter, mm -hmm. do we have anything in there that says that uh, we, Sanitary District, has a code enforcement going around checking? Now, if, if we could do some kind of article on that, because people think it's the city and it's us, you know? And, and I, I was surprised how they're starting to notice it, you know? But I, I think we should get the credit. I think you need a big banner to hang from the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, anything else for Ed? Always thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Item three, Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, actually, item number three and four are just uh, are receiving file reports and happy to answer any questions if you have. Questions on the ton uh, organics or solid waste diversion? Okay, let's go to Good. item five. Thank you, Mr. President. Nabila Guzman will give this report. Good morning, President Schieffer, members of the board. Over the last 10 months, staff and CRNR have been negotiating for a new contract to continue to provide solid waste and recycling collection services. The following deal po points have been agreed upon by staff and CRNR. A fixed term limit of 10 years with the two five-year extension options. So we've gotten rid of the evergreen clause um, and the board of directors will have the option to solicit bids towards the end of the 10-year term or the board can extend the agreement for another five years. There will be a district-wide door-to-door household hazardous waste collection program. Each household will be allowed three pickups per year with a maximum of 15 gallons or 125 pounds per pickup, and that can change depending on the permit that the county gives us. So those are the amounts right now, but it could change in the future, and we will notify the board and uh, residents as well. We will be having a free mulch event. Once a year, CRNR will provide free mulch to residents in the springtime. Uh, CRNR will reimburse CMSD with uh, $30,000 the first year and $35,000 every year after, along with annual CPI increases for various programs, including public education, anti-scavenging, hiring a consultant to evaluate CRNR's performance, and a donation for our battery recycling program. The new contract will also include a comprehensive outreach program that will help CMSD achieve 75% diversion. A CRNR sustainability coordinator will dedicate approximately 20 hours a week promoting solid waste diversion programs in the district. Attached is a description of the plan and one idea is to recognize residents for doing a good job with their recycling efforts by having a photo of them in the newsletter and awarding them a gift card. We will continue to have a free rollout service for seniors and ADA residents. A physician's notes will be needed to set up the service, but they can contact the district and then we will notify CRNR. For those residents that want their carts pulled out but can provide a doctor's note, there will be a valet service. It'll be $35 a month and CRNR will roll out and service up to three carts on their trash days. The fee of $35 will go directly to CRNR. And lastly, a CPI increase. CRNR can request a two-year CPI rate increase, but the request will have to go to the board for approval. Some cities have automatic CPI rate increases, but staff believe that the district will lose control setting the rates if an automatic adjustment is implemented. CRNR agreed to allow CMSD to review their financial books to determine whether their profit margin, uh, what their profit margin is with CMSD before a uh, rate increase is presented to the board. There is one point that was not agreed upon between staff and CRNR, and that is the GPS system on CMSD computers. 
Um, staff requested access to the GPS system uh, to, con to improve our customer service. For instance, when residents want to learn when their carts are emptied, staff can give residents the location of the nearest truck and approximate time of arrival. Uh, CRNR has not agreed to uh, please uh, give us access to their GPS system, but they did allow us video. Uh, they did allow us. Uh, they did offer to let us see their video recording of the trash route, so we could see if a cart is emptied or not. But. Just two weeks ago, I requested a video and their operations team denied it. They said that it took too long to extract the video and it would take even longer to find the point, the location I was looking for, so they said no. Um, CRNR also offered to designate a CRNR employee to the district to answer requests for missed pickups immediately and get in touch with affected residents in hopes of alleviating the number of calls the district receives. CMSD has offered to pay for all costs associated with the GPS system, including licenses, installation, and maintenance fees, but CRNR is still unwilling to accept, citing concerns about GPS data becoming public record. Staff has consulted the district council whether GPS tracking data constitutes a public record, and if so, how long the record must be kept. It was advised that there is no, there's no retention requirement for GPS records, and staff would be able to delete GPS data every few days without violating the Public Records Act or any privacy of the resident. This concludes my report. If the board has any questions, I would be happy to answer. Gee, does the board have any questions? <laughs> my main concern is getting this contract signed. It's been, what, 10 months or a year? Mm -hmm. and, and the GPS could be an addenda item that we could do later, but let's get the contract signed. That's where I'm coming from. Okay. <coughs> um, You know, we've had discussion on both sides. I mean, we, we've received letters from CRNR. We've gotten opinions from Allen. Uh, as to, and we seem to have, a, you know, <laughs> diametrically opposed opinions. Or can, can Allen, do you want to take this, Scott? Where are we? What, what's the, what's the decision-making process? And why are we hung up on this, I guess, is where, where I'm at. I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and I, I think, um, and, and Mr. C and R can, can um, um, offer some points, but I think their, their concern is um, um, uh, of property information that might be released and, and um, with their own GPS system, and that's, that's why um, it was suggested that if, if we, can, we can pay our own GPS system on the trucks, and we went back and said, yeah, we, we can do that. We found the cost, so if we put our own system on there, um, we're not sure why that would be an issue. Then their attorney is saying that there's, there's liability issues. Um, again, I, I think we have some questions into that because um, I've talked to um, other general managers that have GPS in their trucks, and they um, concur with Alan about regarding the vague, vagueness of the Public Records Act. They, they delete uh, the information when they want to. Um, they find it to be very helpful information. Um, we also know that, you know, my, I, I believe that having a system on our website where, where residents can find out where the trucks are located, when they're going to be, um, um, when they're going to be in their neighborhood to pick up the trucks. Uh, waste management does that for their system. So if waste management can do that, I don't know why we can't do it. So I think there's just some different, different philosophies. And um, my belief is just a, a better way of more efficiently and, and, and enhances customer service. Maybe a more direct question to Alan. I know. We have in the Bemis report it says that the GP uh, the records can be deleted every few days. CRNR's council is saying that that's not necessarily the case. That we have to keep the GPS records based on our records retention schedule. Where are we on that, or what's your opinion on that? Let me just say that uh, this this issue has only arisen at least I'm only aware of it for the last two weeks. So it's not like this has been lingering forever, but. Um, they have a GPS system on their truck already that we could get access to. Uh, I think there is a disagreement about and a, a vagueness in the law about keeping records. The, uh, a city has to keep records a certain amount of time. Uh, a district uh, doesn't have the same two-year requirement because uh, we have a different statute. 
but certainly if it becomes a public record, then you have to treat it differently. But if you just have access to a record, then it doesn't become a public record until you download it. So it just seems like there's a solution here, and uh, I'm not sure why there's resistance and whether it's been fully explored yet, but um, I guess we do have a disagreement about keeping public records and whether it's required or not. Um, the, other, the other issue that, that CRNR has been pretty open about telling us about it the li is the liability issue. And, you know, what if that record is used for a burglary or, or someone is hurt, you know, and um, can you address that? Can you? I, I don't, I mean, I'm try I was trying to think of this, uh, the theory and that somebody would go on there to see who's not home. I mean, the, it's a, uh, you can drive by a house and you can look at a house it's, that's open. It's, there's not a privacy interest there. You can drive down the street and look at a house. So if it just makes it convenient for an organized burglar who had a methodology mm -hmm. to review these tapes every few days to go burglarize something, I don't quite get that. If it's uh, the fact that they, this could be used in accident, uh, you know, if somebody had an accident and they wanted to use the tape to prove something happened, uh, that would always be the case if you sent a litigation hold to CRNR and say, don't destroy that tape. There was an accident here and that could be useful and then they would have an obligation to not destroy that tape until you subpoena it. So, you know, I mean, I know there's some things thrown out in that letter that like raise issues, but <clears throat> I don't really see it and uh, it's not legally disallowed or prohibited. It's just an argument being raised and I mean, I, I, I guess they deny in their letter that it's about giving up control, but it just seems like that's, that's what it's about. But I, I'm not sure. I, in, in their letter, they say, I'm speculating about that. You're right, I'm speculating. I don't know why they don't want to share more of the information. And then I was talking to Scott just this morning about if they have the GPS already on their system and they would give it to us immediately, then that seems like the perfect solution. But then Nabila told us and Scott confirmed it that they're not so forthcoming when we ask them for things. So if we couldn't get it very quickly, then that eliminates uh, any benefit we have from it because we're looking for quick information. The truck is on this street or something like that. And if they say, yeah, we'll get back in a week, that's like, okay, well, thanks, but, you know, that wasn't helpful. I know that was a rambling answer, but it's, <clears throat> believe me, the, the law on the Public Records Act doesn't, that's not the deciding factor in this matter. There's a solution here. If you, think, if you believe this is going to be a value um, uh, source for the public, then, then you know, let us know, and we'll, we'll still try to work out something with, with uh, CNR. If you don't believe it, is, if, you, if you think we can just go with it with, without it, we'll do that. But uh, we, we need some directions from, from the board. Um, Art's comment, and, and I take the Senate consideration also, is, can we move forward with the contract? Is it possible to leave this as an open end or something that we can talk about at a future date? Does it, I mean, do we have to stipulate in the contract yes or no with the GPS, or can it be an, something out there we can consider? I mean, a lot of the programs that, that, that uh, they're offering, the mulch event, it's spring now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to move forward with a contract, whether we do it with a GPS or not. Is that something we can? I think it'd be a point of the contract without. You know, I appreciate your candor. Okay. That's my, my please. Uh, Dean, did you want to address anything, or are you? Um, we just open any questions you may have. I think our. I, <clears throat> We were, we were forced to hire a municipal attorney on this because of our insurance carrier's concerns and our insurance carri carrier's concern about defense of the district. So uh, I'd rather not comment on her letter. I think it's between our council and your council to resolve that. But um, I, I will say that uh, we're committed, in our letter, we're committed to being more responsive to Nebula and, and, and the staff. Um, uh, to the point that uh, we can respond to a customer's question within two hours. And we've committed to that, and uh, we believe that's sufficient, probably more than sufficient with most of our contracts. So be happy to put that in the contract if you'd like. 
Um, any question? I, I'm just ready to make a motion to accept the contract as presented and try to work on the GPS. Well, we can't do that this morning. We'd have to do it this oh, morning. Okay. This, it's not on. Oh, that's not on our agenda, is it? You, you, you can advise us that those are the terms you'd like to see in the contract that would be placed on a public agenda for formal approval of what That would be my recommendation. Yeah. Okay. I second that recommendation. I don't I think we need a second, but we'll, we can go ahead. Um, one of the things that was proposed or was was put out there was right now if a customer misses a trash they call here and then we call CRNR. There was some discussion about that customer calling directly to CRNR and bypassing us. Is that something we, what's your opinion on that? I mean, the, yeah, they, if, they, if they know CRNR's phone number, they can call them directly, but uh, and some probably do, but also some know they just call us directly, it just happens. You know, it is just. I think I think we need to. Yeah, you know, we still need to know the uh, the number of those kinds of calls. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And we get that by them calling us, and and our number is more readily available. It's on the trash cans. It's in our newsletters. Everywhere. It's CR numbers on the trash can, isn't it? It was Mesa. It's CNR's numbers on the trash can, isn't it? Well, right. the old ones still, and many of them are old. They still, I think, still have the sanitary district number on it. I was thinking it still had the same. Well, I think they had Coast Mesa disposal on it, didn't they? The original cans. What the look? I know it's 8440. Oh. It, it's the same phone number, but they don't say Coast Mesa disposal. I know, but it's, it's, it goes to oh, CRNR. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It yes. goes to CRNR, not to us. So let's take that recommendation. You have our, the recommendation. Um, can we include. Well, I got the second. I don't think you, take, you, don't think you took an action on it yet. Need, do we need to take action on a recommendation now? We can just. Are you starting? Okay. It's a receiving file item, but uh, you can use it in the triggering. Uh, it's a back. Okay, so Arlene seconded it um, and Art made the, made the recommendation. Are you guys willing to put in there? Dean made the, the offer that the customers are contacted within a two hour time frame. But the data is available. Part of your motion. Our time. Yes. Can can that be part of your motion? Yes. Because I I think that's important that we get back to them. Okay. Yeah. Is there any disagreement from anybody on the recommendation? Okay. All right. Any other discussion? Oh, um, I had one something related, but kind of a, on a different vein. I attended the. Southern California Waste Something Forum last Wednesday. It wasn't SWAN. SCWMF or something. And it was really an interesting meeting. And there were a couple of things that they brought up regarding trash and, and haulers and stuff. Uh, but one of the things that one of the people talked about was one of the most aggravating things for me on my organics cart is how dirty it is. And I'm, I know you guys realize this, all of you. Someone, they had a picture of a cart that had a little, like a, you know on your ice chest, the little empty valve down at the bottom where the, you can drain the water out? These carts had a little drain plug down there. Did you guys, <laughs> you're shaking your head, Dean. <laughs> it just seemed like that would have been a great idea. No? It would drain it on the blacktop of the city. <laughs> I'm That's sure the problem. Drain, I would have drained it on my grass to get the, you know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's just so hard to wash that thing out and then turn it over. My wife has been complaining about washing it out <laughs> and having to turn it over. So I think, um, I think CRNR has a program where they come out and do that. Don't they? We, do yeah, that? I remember us talking mm -hmm. about that. And yeah. I, I've been facetious, obviously. We recently purchased those trucks, and uh, the, for a fee, we will come out Could you get that number for my wife? So. <laughs> what is the fee? What, what is the fee? It, does the fee mean all three cans or one I think can? It's up to whatever you ask for. Yeah, whatever you ask for. Maybe that's something we could get in the newsletter, just a note about. Yeah, that's interesting. We're, we're not ready to provide that yet. We've got the trucks. So you need to give us a couple months. No, no, I'm not. I don't think it needs to go in the next newsletter, but eventually, once we yeah, have it, yeah, that'd be real good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, what would be the cost, roughly? Roughly, uh, roughly fifteen to twenty dollars per. Uh, 
Because we could probably have three, three cars. Because we could use some of that money that we're going to get from CRNR every year to probably offset that for citizens. Off, yeah. You know, just a thought. I yeah. mean, 15 to 20 yeah. a car? Actually, we have we have one city that actually wants to do it um, on an a semi-annual basis for the residents, and it'll be a no charge. Okay. Yeah, city of Dana Point, um, of course, they've got a lot of money in the bank, but uh, <laughs> they they've had some concerns about smelly carts in the uh, high density areas in downtown. Hmm. Yeah, let us know when you get that ready. Yeah, sure. Let us know. The main focus of this conference last week, and I'll, I'll give Scott, if it's okay, I'll address this to Gina, uh, had to do with legislative updates. And there's a couple things I'd like some more information on, if you can. Um, interesting, AB 2779, they're going to start requiring that single-use beverage containers have a strap on the cap. Okay. That, that one, I'm not, that was self -explained. The one that was interesting was AB 2115 where they're trying to get a speed limit bill for vehicles passing or overtaking waste service vehicles while they are collecting. I didn't heard that one, but that's, that would be an interesting one to look at. Um, the other one was AB 901, where the recycling reports, I think I got this right, recycling reports are no longer gonna go to the counties, they're gonna go directly to Cal Recycle. Really? Say that again. The recycling report, diversion rates and reports are all going to now go directly, or they're trying to get it to go directly to Cal Recycle rather than through the counties. Is that the one the city puts out each year? I assume that is. So the city will have to now go directly to Cal Recycle. But now are these uh, that you're reading, are they? They're up for consideration yeah, now. Just consideration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, because CSDA doesn't, I, I don't remember seeing any of these with CSDA, but these are these are really solid waste bills. Well, I was going to see what Jeannie can find out, and then okay. maybe okay. for yeah. that to use. Okay, but the speed limit one kind of blew me away. I thought, Jeannie, oh. you can let me know because I go up there again pretty soon. Okay, thanks for your indulgence, all of you. Well, let's go to item number six, Scott. Given this report. All right, good morning, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, item six is the consideration of applicants for the Citizens Advisory Committee. The district has received four applications for the committee and these applications are attached to the staff report for your review. The committee was proposed and approved by the board last October and it intends to provide an opportunity for district residents to learn about the district to meet and discuss district matters and to then provide recommendations to the board of directors on key issues. The committee can have up to 11 members and six members will constitute a quorum. The, um, and as stated in the attached administrative policy which was adopted on October 26th of last year. So at this point the district has only received four applications at this time and we are still in the process of seeking applicants. The four applications will be brought to the March 22nd Board of Directors meeting for um, your approval along with any additional applications that we receive in between now and the board meeting. Um, I wanted to let you know that we did advertise for the committee in the daily pilot, OC Register, um, all of our social media platforms, the district website, and we also did some email blasts through Gov Outreach. Um, I plan on putting an article in the spring newsletter, which is going to come out in about mid-April. So we're hoping to get some feedback through that. And we're also going to reach out um, again to the city of Costa Mesa and to Peach Jar, which distributes uh, flyers to the schools. Question. Um, have we thought about advertising off the uh, city's cable TV? Yes, I did reach out to the city when we first started the program. They didn't respond, so I'm going to try reaching out to them again and hopefully get it on there. Mm -hmm. I, I guess one of the comments I'd make is if we got three or four more people that had the same credentials as these four people, mm -hmm. we'd be in really good shape with this thing. We'd, there's some pretty qualified, I mean, I wish I had the time to get all these degrees. The one person I do have a problem with is Maudie Fields. 
he worked for AAA, so I'm not sure I could really go along with that. <laughs> uh, obviously, I, very qualified. In, yeah, I mean, he, he was very impressive. So um, so the direction at this point is we're, we're at the deadline, coming to the deadline, aren't we? Or we um, we're actually past the deadline. The deadline okay. was um, March 1st. So we've just opened it continuously until we get the amount we need. Do we want to reach out, Scott, maybe to these four people and invite them to a meeting? I would like to try to at least get two more people on the committee. Let's try to get six. You know. Is that okay? I'd say wait till we get at least six. Okay. And then reach out. Yes. Have you notified these people that they've been received? And you might want to, if we're going to extend it, let them know at least that we're going to extend the, that we're looking for a couple more and that we're extending the deadline. <clears throat> a couple people that I had talked to that I thought were going to apply didn't. But that's okay. You still have the chance to, though. Yeah, they could. Okay. Any other questions for Gina on this? Then uh, go forward. Thank you for what you've done so far. Just a question. Do you have an uh, application that I could take to someone? It's on our website, but we can print it out for you if, if you'd you like Maybe to. before I yeah. go today. Sure. Maybe a couple of because I have a couple of people in mind that would be good members. <clears throat> okay, item seven. All right, thank you. Um, for item seven, I'm happy to share that the district has officially been awarded the Orange County Regional Recycling and Waste Reduction Grant in the amount of $30,000. Um, over the course of five years, this grant is going to assist with funding um, the district citizens environmental protection academy as well as enhancing our bilingual public outreach efforts um, uh, particularly for the organics recycling program so during year one they're going to fund a hundred percent of those programs year two they'll fund eighty percent year three they'll fu fund fifty percent and then years four and five we're responsible for a hundred percent to make sure that the programs are sustainable the Citizens Environmental Protection Academy is going to include an educational workshop that we're going to hold here at the district. Um, it's going to feature speakers like Mike Carey from OCC Recycling Center, Joe Jenkins from EEC, um, as well as district staff. And then the Academy is also going to include free tours of local uh, wastewater and recycling facilities, including OCC Recycling Center, CRNR's Materials Recovery Facility, OCSD, OCWD, and also our district yard. And the tentative schedule for the academy is included in the, in the staff report. The workshop is going to be held on Saturday, April 28th from 9 to 11 a.m. And then the tours are going to take place um, during the following, following week on March 3rd and 4th. We've done some advertisements for the academy. Um, they're going to be in the district newsletter, Daily Pilot, OC Register, social media, peach jar. Um, we're utilizing the Chamber of Commerce app. That's fairly new. And we're also going to reach out to some local envir environmentally conscious community groups to help us spread the word. Um, and then in terms of the bilingual public outreach portion of the grant funding, we're going to design and purchase some trash cart hangers that will have English and Spanish messaging um, to let people know that they can utilize their organics recycling carts and what what to put, the, put in them, what not to put in them. Um, we're also going to do a social media campaign that will include some Spanish messaging as well. Excuse me, can you go over those dates again that you're going to have the meeting? You know, the, sure. Can you go over those dates real quick? Yes, so um, Saturday, April 28th is going to be um, what we're calling the workshop where we'll have some speakers here at the district. Um, that day will also include a brief tour of the OCC mm -hmm. Recycling Center um, from 9 to 11 in the morning. And then the um, the rest of the tours will take place the next week on May 3rd. Okay, because you said March, so it's May. Oh, I'm sorry. May. May 3rd and May 4th. <clears throat> okay. Um, we have a web page as well that has that information. <clears throat> We're still waiting on a few. What happens if we don't get the six people to, for the academy? Is this for the academy, right? Um, this, six is people. this is different than the Oh, that's different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For this event, we're looking to serve about 20 people. Um, because we're providing transportation, so we have limited seating. 
Um, so 20, and then we'll take a wait list if there's over 20. So we would get a van or a couple vans to do it? or uh, A shuttle, a shuttle bus. Do um, you think it'd be helpful to have Barry videotape? Yeah, that's the that's the intention. Yes. Oh, so you've already contacted. Okay, good. I, I, that'd, this would be a really neat thing to put on the website, I think, so mm -hmm. people could take a look at it. And it, when they do the groundwater replenishment system, will Director Ferryman be there to to lead the tour? I hope <laughs> he could. <laughs> he could do it for he sure. For him and Bob. Yeah. No, don't send Bob. <clears throat> Okay, any questions for Gina? Good job. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, let's go to a fun one, item eight. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. So this item, was, we are seeking directions from, from the board, and it, it, it's regard to an incident that occurred on February 27th, 2018, when a couple of residents on Sandalwood Street noticed uh, a contractor um, by the name of uh, Luna Sons Concrete uh, popped open one of our manholes and, and uh, used a uh, wheelbarrow to empty uh, um, concrete in, into uh, the sewer system. Uh, they notified the police. The police notified us. We went out there um, and confirmed that, yes, it is um, concrete. Uh, you can see in the pictures, attached pictures. Um, when we interviewed um, the person who did it, he, he said it was just gray water. But, as you can, again, you can see it's, it's more than just gray water. Um, uh, we have uh, obviously um, uh, witnesses that, that that have seen them, took pictures, uh, even a videotape uh, of the discussion. Um, so I think the 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 report, along with all the evidence, is is, is compelling. And so staff today, today staff is is recommending board of directors to request the Orange County District Attorney Tony Rakakis, 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 thank you, Rakakis to commence and prosecute an appropriate action against Luna and Sons Concrete for violating District <coughs> Operations Code Section 609-040, unlawful to dump unauthorized materials into the district sewer system, and direct district counsel to submit the district's investigative report to the district attorney. So we just do a recommendation? I mean, this is an action. This is action. <coughs> I believe that we do this. Second. I have a question. Does uh, ha have you tried to negotiate with this guy at all, or uh, you think this is so onerous that uh, we need to take this action? Pretty onerous, yeah. I, I think we, I think this action is appropriate. We've also submitted. We also incurred about eighteen hundred dollars uh, with costs, and, and we submitted that bill to them. I don't, Steve, have received it. No, we still have not received any money. So, so not only will we go after criminally, but we, if we don't receive. Um, the money we can go after um, small claims as well. The uh, obviously <coughs> he's doing some work for a resident. Yes. What, what's the story from the resident? I don't know. We didn't we didn't interview the resident where he was doing work on. Wouldn't we? Con shouldn't we contact the resident? We could if you want to. Sure. Uh, do we know who the resident is? I don't think so. No. Uh, he did come out. We're not sure of that. Huh? But um, while we were out, the city also came by the inspector, and because they got a call to the they came to report. Their code enforcement came out also. When I was talking to the inspector from the city, they also had problems with the same company of throwing stuff into the storm drains. So they're going to do it on a regular basis. Yeah. The, the, the pictures that you guys did down in the line are one thing. The pictures that were taken by, I assume, a, a resident, a neighbor, is that a particular? So, some pictures are from, um, from us, some are from the residents. So the pictures are like the truck, and there's a picture of a kid working in a driveway or something. Who, who took those? I took those. I oh, okay. The next morning, I really did see what the damage was. Uh, I pulled up, and Did they pour liquid? Con I, I it's like um, kind of like slurry. Okay. Mm. But you know, still get hard. Yeah. Time. You were able to clean it out quick enough to. Yeah. Luckily, it was the end of the mammal, or the end of the line, so top of the line. So you had no flow coming in that direction that could be destructive, but still, you know, it's a problem. Yeah, don't we have a 
motion a second. I don't mind. I'll support it. But I think the resident needs to know that the contractor he hired did this work. Whether he denies it or not, it's pretty obvious to see him working in the driveway. So mm -hmm. I think as part of it, we need to let them make, make sure that the resident knows. Plus the contractor needs to know that he can't do that. I mean, Where's the contractor located? I just go to Santa Ana. Santa yes, Ana. Santa Ana. I didn't even look. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you again, President Schaefer. My name is Jim Moser. If I can make a public comment. Uh, in, in addition to violating the operations code, looking at the staff report here, the, this, this part of it, at, at the end of the redacted pages here, it says that the Costa Mesa police officer also cited penal code section 374.2, uh, which he, he asserts prohibits dumping material into a sewer system. So I, I would think that would be part of your advice to the district attorney, that there are multiple violations, not just of the operations code. President Schaefer, if I may, yeah, we, it's our uh, duty to report and direct the uh, district attorney to file on our ordinance violations. He will on his own make a determination and that will be part of the mix is that there's a penal code violation too. And it's, it's a little more complicated of a statute. He may charge both and then, you know, how these things work. Um, there's a plea to one and a, a fine or a something and probation or w whatever happens out of this matter, but it'll all be part of the mix. But all those facts will be before okay. district attorney will talk. <coughs> and we've talked to the investigator over there who specializes in this, and he was very uh, interested in this matter and certainly had the time to uh, devote to this. So there should be a good workup. But our citizens were incredible that um, brought this to our attention that got involved. And as you may have seen from the video, they. He actually confronted the uh, contractor saying, you can't do that, and took a video. And it, it was really an amazing uh, act of uh, citizens, uh, you know, stepping up and doing the right thing. It's, yeah. it's okay that we have uh, a motion and a second. Uh, I'll call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? That motion carries 5 to 0. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for your input here. Or work on it. Okay. Um, any comments or communications from the directors? Okay. Then at this point, I'm going to turn my phone off. <laughs> uh, I'm going to. tickets? No. Um, we need to go into a closed session. Um, we don't need to do roll call because that's already been established and the order we're already in order. Uh, this has been set aside for a uh, conference with legal counsel on existing litigation, Government Code 54956.9D1, Costa Mesa Sanitary District versus Mesa Water District. And with that, we will adjourn to closed session. Okay. I'm going to reconvene from open, uh, from, excuse me, from closed session to open session. Uh, regarding existing litigation, Government Code 54956.9D1, Coast Mesa Sand District versus Mesa Water. Uh, the board has given direction to our council regarding a settlement conference in this matter before a judge. So council has our direction. And if there's nothing else, we will adjourn the meeting. I'll just add that that's a dollar figure. for litigation. Okay. Thank you. Then we are adjourned.